This video presentation on winter grazing by Dr. Lisa Black at University of Georgia is part of a six-part series on beef cattle production organized by Fort Valley State University, Dr. Nikki Whitley and Stefan Price, along with AgriUnity LLC, Mr. Handy Kennedy. So Dr. Baxter is a forage is our forage specialist for University of Georgia located in Tifton. She's going to be presenting about winter grazing. All right. So usually when we talk about extending grazing into winter, there's there's three different ways we can do that. Um, easy ways are grazing crop residues and stockpiling forages. Those don't work for everybody in the state though. One of our biggest advantages in Georgia is planting winter annuals. And so that's what we're gonna talk about today. You know, it, it's not just Georgia, really throughout the entire Southeast. What really sets us apart from other cattle producers in the country is our ability to grow a lot of different winter annual forages. You name it, it can probably grow in some part of our state. Uh, the problem is, is they don't all grow in every part of the state. They require a lot of inputs uh, compared to a stockpile or grazing what's left over after a corn harvest or something. But we see some really big outputs from grazing these winter annuals. So like I said, there, there's a lot of different options. We're going to talk through some of the, the kind of big picture options that we have, and I'm going to tell you um, where to go get more information because we could spend an hour talking about just the different winter annual species and varieties that we grow. There's not one that's necessarily the best. Everybody wants to know, well, what's the best one or what do I think is the best one? And that, that doesn't matter. Um, what matters is which one's the best for you and your farm. And, and no two people on here are going to answer the same in the, the same way and at the same time and, and so on. So we want to choose whatever forage is going to work best for your farm in that given year with your level of management and ultimately what your goal is because we all have different goals for our operation. So broadly, we're going to talk about, you know, kind of the big group here is the small grains. Uh, so these are rye, oats, wheat, triticale, anything that, that could be grown as a grain crop, we can graze as a, as a forage crop. Um, as a general rule, this group is very easy to plant and manage. So if you've never planted a winter annual, um, I would, this is the group I would start with. Uh, the problem with these is that the growth isn't well distributed throughout the entire season. So you know, one of the easiest ones to, to plant and grow is rye. So that's usually what people start with. Um, the problem with rye is that it can be very early maturing and we can have this gap between kind of March into early May that we don't have a lot of grazing if we've only planted rye out there. So the big benefit of rye is it really jumps up out of the ground. It gives us some really aggressive fall growth and that's why it plays out so early. Uh, usually by Valentine's Day or so, you start seeing a lot of seed heads popping up and, and it's done then. Um, but in that time between kind of early December and, and late February, we get a lot of growth out of something like rye. Um, it does very well in terms of cold tolerance where something like oats can winter kill uh, and can generally be more productive than a lot of the other small grain options that we have. The other big forage that we see a lot in Georgia uh, is ryegrass. Um, and, and a lot of people kind of shorten ryegrass and say rye, but these are two very different things. So with the ryegrass, it's actually capable of producing the greatest tonnage of forage across the season. This is where all the ifs come in. If we get the stand established successfully, if we plant it early, if we go in and graze it correctly, if we get the rainfall and put the fertilizer out and everything, it can produce a lot of just rocket fuel forage, but it relies on a lot of ifs. Ryegrass is also fairly easy to grow. A lot of people will go out and broadcast ryegrass and it's gonna do better than, than rye if you have to broadcast instead of drill. Uh, the problem that I have with, with ryegrass, especially when I'm working with producers in the coastal plains because many of the cattle producers I work with aren't just cattle producers in the coastal plains. 
they're also row crop farmers. And what we run into with ryegrass is it's really gearing up and going in late February, early March. And that's when you see the bulk of the production, but that's when we need to be planting corn for the first time in the year. And so it doesn't pair well in a lot of crop field situations. Now, if you're just overseeding a, a Bermuda pasture, it could be a really good option. We just have to make sure that we're eradicating that ryegrass at the right time. So when our Bermuda grass should be greened up early May, it's not interfering with it there. So we don't have to just plant one or the other. Um, so this was some work out of Arkansas several years ago, and I don't wanna get very data heavy. I think this may actually be my only data slide in here. Um, but I wanna kind of point you to, uh, so we have ryegrass there in the first column, and then there's, there's oats, rye, triticale, and wheat. So our big small grains paired with the ryegrass. And so these would be a situation where if you had a big and a small seed box on the drill, you could put the small grain in one and the ryegrass in the other. Um, what we often end up doing is we plant the rye one way and the ryegrass another way out in the field um, to help give that really good coverage. But what I want you to look at there is look at that increased gain in pounds per acre from that rye and ryegrass compared to if we just planted ryegrass alone or if we paired it with something else. Um, that rye plus ryegrass gives us that really good season long production. We get the early grazing from the rye and the late grazing from the ryegrass. Uh, and as a result of that, we see a big net return per acre because of that long, se that long grazing season. So a lot of people really love annual clovers and, and they have their place. Um, there's a lot that the list that I have on there doesn't include probably half of them. Um, most of us, if we are gonna plant an annual clover, it's gonna be a crimson clover is one of the most popular ones, especially in the Southern part of the state. You'll, we have some air leaf ball and bursin, but crimson's the big one. Uh, these pair really well with, a, with the grass. I don't like planting them on their own just because they don't produce a lot of tonnage. Um, if you think about just even the, the little clover growing in your yard, it's all leaves and not a lot of stem. And so if it's, it's not providing just that bulk material that we sometimes need to keep our cows full. And, and so that's why I like to put those two together. The problem with the, the clovers is they really need a soil pH at, at least six or so in most cases for that optimum growth. We're not going to see as full, much or meet that potential that we could if we don't have, if we have those more acidic pH uh, soils out there. My other issue with clovers is that the clovers are great, but weed control comes first. And so if we have winter weeds that are so big and thick that they're taking out our rye or ryegrass, we need to spray a herbicide for that rather than trying to say, well, I don't want to kill that 10, 5 or 10% crimson clover I have out there. So clovers are great. They are one of the most nutritious forages that we can grow. They eliminate our need for nitrogen, but weed control is going to come first in my book. So the last group here is the brassicas. Um, there's a whole list on there as well. Uh, and, and there's a lot of different hybrids of those. That one in the picture is actually a rape kale hybrid um, that's called T-Raptor. Uh, people think I'm joking, but it's T-Raptor just like the dinosaur. Uh, and if it grows in Alapaha, Georgia, it can grow anywhere, I tell you. Um, I love brassicas because they're, they're, they work well where other stuff doesn't. So in a drought prone soil, something that can be, tend to be waterlogged and then one week and droughty the next week, this is where they fit. Um, the problem with brassicas, depending on your, the situation with your fencing, is that the cows have to be trained to graze these. Uh, it's not like you open the gate and they go in there and put their head down and start grazing the first day. They're going to go in there and look back at you, um, wondering what you just sent them into. They're going to test your fences. They, you, you're going to have to leave them in there for about three, three days or so before they'll start kind of putting their head down and start eating. They are gonna yell and test the fences um, just when you think that they're gonna fall over dead because they haven't ate anything in three days. 
they'll finally put their head down and start eating and they perform really well on the brassicas. Um, it helps if you have some older cows and they get in the routine of this and they kind of treat, train the younger cows um, to say, hey, we, you know, this is okay. We can actually eat this. It's not going to hurt us. Um, so you, you kind of think about it like you have teenagers that do they want to eat ice cream or do they want to eat turnip greens? Same thing with the cows. We got we to gotta force them in there to eat those turnips over the first time. Um, once they do, they're fantastic, but it can be a loud three days to get to that first grazing. So regardless of, of which forage here that you choose, um, unfortunately, many annual forages will fail or at least not perform Form as we expect them to because we, have a, we haven't planned ahead. Um, and so I, we're not gonna walk through every step of, of planting of those forages, but I wanna hit some of the highlights or the, the most common problems that I see. Um, so if somebody calls and says, hey, I want to plant whatever, my first question back is always, have you taken a soil test? Um, we wanna test at least six to 12 months prior to planting if possible. There's never a bad time to take a soil test, but there are certainly some times that are better than others. Uh, so if, if we're thinking about planting a legume in the fall, then we should have sampled, you know, six, eight months ago to make sure we have time to put our lime out and get our pH where it needs to be. The second one is getting that drill ready before it's time to plant. It, it never fails. Uh, something's always going to be clogged or broken or whatever problem you want to put there. Um, you name it, I've probably seen it on a drill. Um, we want to make sure that we go in and have our, our seed cups and drop tubes prepped and cleaned out. There's almost always going to be spiders or some other bug insect thing that, that's started living up in those drop tubes because a drill is not something that we use day in and day out. Uh, and they really that really affects seed flow. We want to clean out all of the hoppers um, especially if you're using a drill that multi multiple people have used, it's really easy to just sit the, the bag of unused seed back up in the drill. Uh, drill set for six months, it's absorbed moisture, you got a mess on your hands. I have found more tools, that, and there's more tools I think in the drills at the station here than in toolboxes because of all the hammers and wrenches and stuff I've found in the hoppers. Uh, and it's really annoying to have to dig those out after you've dumped your seed in. Um, the big one there is calibrate. Um, just because the drill has settings on it, we don't want to trust those settings because things change over time. We also want to make sure that we're setting up for the proper drops. So if we have a, a drill that has three or four different boxes and, and tubes on it, uh, we want to make sure everything's going the way that it, we intend for it to go. Um, sometimes when we're planting a legume, we won't plant every row, we'll plant every other row, um, and we'll just go in and duct tape over the ones that we don't want to use. We have to make sure, though, that our tubes that we've calibrated for and everything line up with the ones that we haven't duct taped. And the last one there is set your press wheels. Um, so we often see that the press wheels are, are up um, in the air for, for transport, and we never put them back down, so they're not doing their job. The next one is planting at the right rate in the right time. And, and I know you probably can't see what all's in that table and it's not really important right now and have the link for it later. But the big thing is that more seed doesn't always mean more yield. Um, it actually can create a lot of competition and decrease yield and, and lead to a failed stand if we put out too much seed. Uh, the rate that we recommend is gonna depend on how we're putting it out um, we need to correct it for germination and, and seed purity. If we're putting two forages together, then we reduce the, the rate by at least a third for each forage that we're putting in there. And then if it has a coating as well, like our clovers tend to have coatings on there. Um, so, so we've got a link for that, that table there, but um, it's really tempting to say, well, if I want 10% more yield, I'll just, put, I'll just put another bag of seed in the drill. And that's not, unfortunately, that's not how it works. Probably the number one cause of planting failure uh, is planting at the, we got to plant the correct depth. Um, we don't have recommendations for every seed listed, but if, you're, if, there, if you run across one that's not listed, um, 
the culters that are on the front of the drill that kind of start that line in front of the press or in front of the disc that where the seeds drop in should be about twice the size of the seed. Uh, so those little clover seeds and everything, that's why we have to plant so shallow is because of those really small seed size. Um, most of our legumes aren't gonna be planted deeper than about a quarter of an inch. Our small grains, we can go a little deeper down to a half or an inch or so. If given the option, I'd rather plant too shallow than too deep. Um, if it's too shallow, we can always run a roller bar or drive over it or something to push that seed down deeper. If, if it's planted too deep, we don't have any tools to help pull that seed back up to the surface and it's a failed stand from the beginning. Um, so I always err on the side of caution and try to, to set the drill shallow. And the reason planting depth is so important is, is our seeds have a, a finite amount of energy in there. Um, and so they have to be able to reach the soil surface before those energy reserves are exhausted or we don't have the photosynthesis that's beginning to restore or to fuel that energy for that plant. So we'll have a lot of legumes like alfalfa or the clovers that have been sunk, you know, an inch or so deep. They don't have enough energy to reach that soil surface and so they'll try to germinate and they're still a half inch below ground. So if, if given the option, drilling is always going to be preferred, um, but broadcasting can be an option um, for small seeded forages. Um, there's a lot of different broadcast spreaders out there. You can manually walk and, and crank them out, mount it on some sort of ATV or utility vehicle, or put it on a tractor and spread with the PTO. Regardless, we want to use some sort of, of cultipacker or roller bar to make sure that we have that really good seed to soil contact. Um, that's usually why broadcasting fails is because of that poor contact. Um, so we're gonna wanna increase that seeding rate as well, um, usually by 15 to 25% if we're broadcasting, just to ensure that we get a, the number of successful plants out there that we need for a good stand. So there's a lot of different forage resources that we've, that we've made available um, that I'd you know, encourage you to, to, um, to pursue if you're a new producer or just want some quick refreshers on things. Um, our website is the georgiaforages.com. So if you just type in UGA forages, Georgia forages, whatever, it'll take you right there. Um, information on the species and varieties, links to our extension bulletins, et cetera, it's all on there. Um, we're hoping to, to kind of revamp that website in the, in the coming months and to make it a little more user friendly, especially as we all kind of transition from laptops to cell phones. Uh, the, the website looks great on, on a laptop. It can be hard to use in its current form on the cell phone. So we're going to work on that. I'd encourage you to subscribe to our email blast. So we should have one going out sometime tomorrow with all of our upcoming events and everything in there. Um, and then also our, our forage extension team has a blog. And so I think it's four or five times a year. Uh, our county agent team, we have nine or excuse me, 12 county agents that are, are our forage team. Um, they write different producer driven articles um, that are relevant to that time of year. And we post them on the blog there. Uh, we have a lot of different UGA extension bulletins. So that one that the table came out of is, is the one they're preparing and calibrating that no-till drill. Um, we're working on, you know, over time, we, we update these bulletins for, with more relevant information. A complaint that I've had with a lot of the older ones is they're, they're too big and bulky, and we want something that we can keep in our billfold or keep on the, in the dash of our truck or something like that. And so we're actually reworking a lot of these bulletins down to a one pager um, so that you can have, all right, I need to calibrate my drill. What are the steps? Here's a one pager, steps one to 10 with what you need to do. Um, so you're, you'll kind of see over the next few years, the traditional extension bulletin, at least on the forage side, start to, to be very refined and to dial down to that information that you really need to know and be practical in the build. So there's only so much reading we can all do. Um, so I'd encourage anybody that that's, uh, has the computer there that can is, is a fan of YouTube. Um, we have our new Georgia Forges YouTube channel. 
Uh, so weekly, I'm, I'm putting videos up usually every Friday, posting a new one on kind of a, a hot topic in forage management. Uh, so if my phone has just blown up about something in a given week, that's what our video is going to be about. Most likely this week's videos is gonna, video is going to be on, on molds and baleage and hay because my phone has blown up these past two weeks on what's this white stuff or red stuff or whatever stuff growing on my hay and baleage. So it, they're, they're not really long PowerPoint type presentations. Uh, I've got a software that I use to make it a little more graphic and, or, and, and appeasing there. So that way we, we kind of dial down the, the information into a three to 10 minute video, depending on the topic. Um, anything from drill calibration to forage sampling. The last week's video was getting your hay fields ready for winter. So there, there's a variety on there. And I, I take suggestions for new videos all the time. We also post the videos. We premiere them Thursday nights because Thursday is one of our, our big cattlemen's nights um, across the state. And so in, in the wake of the, the pandemic this summer, this is something that we started. So every, every Thursday from 7 to 8, you can log on to our Facebook page um, and ask questions live there. Uh, so we have the pre-recorded video that, that plays there, you know, repeats you know, four or five times, depending on how long that video is. Uh, and I'm there kind of live chatting if anybody has questions throughout. If you want more information about just getting a better understanding of all things forages, um, I'd really encourage you to sign up for our Grass Masters program. It, it starts out with this is a grass, this is a legume, and builds up from there. Uh, and and really starts going into to grazing management and then improving soil health there at the end. Uh, it's a great deal. I think it's only $25 to register and that's all your program materials. You get uh, one or two forage books to go with it um, and, and a lot of different access to a lot of different resources. Uh, this is the first time that we've taught it virtually. No, normally we only pull from a four or five county area for each event. And so we even have people registering from out of state this time, since it's the first time it's been taught virtually. So I'd really encourage you to, to, to look at signing up for that if you're new to the forage side. If any of you are, are as upset as I am about Sunbelt Ag Expo being canceled this year, um, we design our whole season down there to harvest hay during Expo week. And so even though Expo's canceled, we still have to harvest hay. And so I've been working with the crew um, to plan a hay field day. And so if you're kind of new to hay production and want to know how exactly to get your mower set just right. How are we setting that rake to make sure we don't leave any material on the ground, but we're also not tearing up the ground, things like that. Um, we've got a whole line of hay equipment coming from Kubota to, to just play with that afternoon. We're going to walk through it step by step, going really nice and slow um, on all those little things that, that tend to get overlooked in hay production. Um, we put a lot of work into our forage, and it's a shame to get to the final step there and not have your baler set correctly or something like that and, and send it all downhill. I wanted to leave plenty of time for questions, um, so I'm actually going to stop the screen share so that way I can see faces and stuff and not just a little box on the side of the screen. So if you all have any questions on kind of different winter annuals to grow, how to plant them or any other forage questions, I'd be happy to take those. I have a, I have a question or a comment. Uh, uh, most of these farmers may be small, small uh, cattle producers and may not own a, uh, a grain drill. Uh, are there any possibilities where some association may rent a grain drill? Now, the, uh, in some states, the uh, conservation district may have some grain drills to, to, to lease. So, uh, is and uh, maybe a possibility that you have a few farmers in the same vicinity, they may want to own one grain drill. So that's been my experience that the small farmers really don't own a grain drill because they don't use it that much. We were working on a list through Georgia Farm Bureau of tracking down all of those available for rent. I don't think they made it very far. Um, I would suggest contacting whoever your, your county extension agent is and they would know better than I would in your specific area if the conservation district has one um, or if there's a local producer that rents theirs out or so on. 
uh, Wayne Swanson. I had a question. Uh, I wonder if you guys can do a video on these uh, grazing sticks, on how to use them properly. Mm -hmm. um, but I think I got it, but I'm not certain that I'm getting the right amount of dry matter in my equation when I'm using the stick. So if, uh, just a video to tutor or tutorial. No, that that's that is an easy one to do. So we can certainly do that. Okay, thank you. A grazing sticks are a really powerful tool. Unfortunately, they're they're usually used out of, out of place because we all get tired and want to walk right inside the gate and take our reading and leave. And that's where we see a lot of problems with them. Um, but no, we can certainly do a video on that. Well, thank you very much. That, that is fun. <laughs> Hey, Dr. Baxter, I'm um, Rodney West. I've been taking your Master Cattleman's class, and I, this is my second um, hearing of your information, which I'm uh, grateful of. Can you expound a little bit on the, um, I think you talked about in our Master Cattleman's class, the uh, advantages and disadvantages of fescue in our area. Um, I think it was pertaining to the end of fight. Right. So... Much of the fescue that's grown in the state of Georgia um, is the old school Kentucky 31. Um, it supports a lot of cattle in our country, um, but it has it has a lot of problems, uh, mostly because of that that tall fescue endophyte. So, the the part of the grass that makes it so robust and resilient uh, to where we we could just we beat it up, we beat it up, and it just keeps growing back also causes a lot of problems in cattle uh, and not just cattle, cattle, sheep, goats, horses, you, you name it, they, they cause different problems. Um, so we really wanna, if, if we're looking at transitioning or planting something new, we're gonna encourage you to plant uh, a novel end of fight. So the new ones are um, uh, Jessup Max Q2 and uh, Texoma Max Q2, but the, the Jessup's probably gonna be the better fit for us in Georgia. Um, kind of paired with that, uh, we're also seeing the, the growing zone for tall fescue restored. Um, so we're not, not going to debate climate change or all that, but it, it's getting hotter in Georgia. And so we're seeing Bahia grass move further north, which means our tall fescue line is also re receding further north. Um, we used to be able to, to readily recommend tall fescue all the way down to the lower Piedmont. And now we really don't recommend it much below the, the mountainous region and upper Piedmont, um, just because we're going to encourage producers to switch to a Bermuda grass because of the weather. Add his book. Can you hear me? Yep. So um, obviously I'm via phone, and um, or in a, I know this is going to be recorded. You mentioned that up front. Uh, would any of these classes? Um, be available later on. So is that in relation to this presentation or those other ones that I mentioned? Y yours and the ones to come. The ones in this series will be made available. And as far as the <laughs> grass masters or any of those, I'm not sure if they record those and as well. So the, yeah, the team made the decision not to record the grass masters. Um, they really want people there in person for those. Uh, and so I think that's how they arrived at that decision. Um, anything that, that I've pres or talked about presenting um, with our, our short management videos each week, those are all available later on YouTube. Um, yes, thank you, Dr. Baxter. Great presentation. Question, um, if you're a small farmer and you were to start tomorrow, what would you recommend? The winter annuals? Or yeah. just what to do first? Um, basically, you don't have a grain drill. You're a very small farmer. You have um, a broadcaster and you want to um, put something down for your cattle this fall. What, should mm -hmm. I, what can I do today? So if we don't have a so if we don't have any sort of drill available and we have to go with the broadcasting option, then we're going to want to go in and mow as low as we can, um, graze down once that grass is dormant, 
and go in and broadcast over that. Um, if most of you are in a, or a Bermuda grass area, I really don't like disking Bermuda grass. Uh, I'm not a fan of that at all. Um, everybody wants to plant and then just turn it under. Uh, what you, you've done in that case, is, yeah, you, you put the seed in the ground, but all those weeds that were a couple inches deep uh, that may not have came up this year are now on the soil surface and they're going to come up and beat out whatever you just put in the ground. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Omer McCants. Uh, yes, I'm in, I'm in Talbot County, Dr. Dr. Baxter, and I've, I've already purchased my, my ryegrass. And you mentioned that, that production, food production and not ryegrass, rye, food production is good to the end of February. What do you do after that? What's the interim between February and when, gra when summer grasses grow? Yeah, so you, you may get the ride to stretch a little further, but it, it really does start to play out, especially if we pushed it. Um, so that's where a, a late season ryegrass uh, that you could go in and plant in November or so to have ready for that March time frame would come in. Uh, or that's a situation where we're gonna feed hay until our Bermuda grass is ready to go again. Any more questions? Hey, Stan, Stefan, this is Handy. I have a question pertaining to the um, the clovers. I'm a I'm a big fan of clover. I, I kind of like that late um, um, production of clover, especially for the nitrogen. But I I guess you said that it's because of uh, you're trying to uh, determine which one's more important, the nitrogen or the um, or the weed. So. Is there any other clover that can ha handle herbicides? Uh, that's just, we ought to look when it comes to clover and trying to spray for weeds. Yeah, so it's it's a trade-off. Um, Corteva AgriScience is working on a product that, will, that won't kill white clover or red clover, but will kill other broadleaf weeds. Um, but we're still a year out probably from that being on the market. Um, if we're in a situation where we don't have at least 30% clover out there, um, we're not seeing the full benefit from that clover. So we're not significantly um, fixing enough nitrogen or improving the diet of those animals to justify keeping it out there with sacrificing other components of our forage production. Um, and so usually what, what we run into is it's more in the summertime um, rather than as we get into winter, as we, we have a lot of pigweed or uh, horse nettle or you name it, broadleaf weed this year uh, that starts showing up uh, and, and producers are hesitant to spray for those because of the long plant back period uh, on the, on, for, or for those clovers. Um, so if, if we've, a lot of times if we've treated with something other than, than a 2,4-D or dicamba, we're not going to be plant, or plant, if we treated with those this summer, we're not going to be plant, be able to plant clovers this fall because of that plant back period. Um, so what I encourage producers to do in that case, if they, if they kind of want that balance out there, you don't have to treat your whole farm the same way. And that goes if we have two acres or 200 acres. Um, there's nothing saying that we can't say, all right, on this side of my house this year, we're going to control all the broadleaf weeds. And then on this side of my house, the cows or sheep or whatever, they'll get whatever they, that whatever's growing. And then next year, switch that. Um, so it, it can be hard to kind of piece together the management like that, um, but it gives us the opportunity to, to start getting something under control without doing an entire farm renovation all at once. So, so that leads me to my second question. Um, is, do you have any recommendation on ryegrass? You know, I've been searching for some um, ryegrass and I know someone said um, Marshall. Then I called my local uh, supply store. They said, well, no, um, Big Boss. Is there any recommendations you can give us um, what we should look for as far as um, rye grass to mix with our rye grain? So our rye, our recommended rye grass list is like a mile long compared, oh. compared to our other ones. Um, so I don't have all of those memorized off the top of my head. But if you go to our website, 
um, and click on the species and varieties and ryegrass. And uh, then we have a list and it's broken down by area. And if they're a little earlier maturing or later maturing. Um, I don't think Big Boss is on our list. I'm pretty sure Marshall still is. Um, Nelson's a really solid one that does well for a lot of people. Um, and I know there's some new ones that we just added to the list this year. And how do I get access to that list? You say just go to what, University of Georgia? Uh, yeah, just georgiaforages.com. Okay, Georgia, um, Georgia. Okay, got it. And it, it's really easy once you, once you get on, on there to, to dial it down into the um, specific uh, spe or the species that you're looking for. And we have variety lists for every one of them on there. A quick question. Uh, do you recommend rotation of raising with the rye ryegrass? Right. So uh, and I, I need to email um, Dr. Whitley and everyone, the uh, the Georgia Cattlemen's article that goes with this presentation in case you all aren't part of Georgia Cattlemen yet. Um, so part of kind of really maximizing the utilization on these winter forages is some form of a rotational grazing. Um, a, a lot of times we're gonna recommend um, drip grazing if possible, uh, depending on how, and, and some of that depends on how the field's set up. Um, we've got some really odd shaped fields here in Tifton that you can want to graze in a strip all day long and it's just not going to happen. Um, but what we, what we like about strip grazing is instead of feeding a bale of hay every day, we're pulling another fence. And so we really kind of take those cows across the field, you know, 10 fence posts at a time and kind of spoon feed that forage out to them. Um, so it doesn't give them the chance to go in and really trample the forage down and see a lot better utilization from it. So I was wondering if you, what kind of, can you do mixtures? Because I have a, a horse client who does a mixture. And if so, would you put them out, would you mix them all together in a field or I guess you could do different fields, like you said, and do different things in different fields. What do you think? So and, is, I, and sorry, is chicory an option around here? It can be. Um, it depends on what you're calling chicory because there's a lot of different things that people call chicory and I'm not so sure some of them are or not anymore. Um, so if you're going to mix stuff, I like to mix things like a small grain and a clover or a small grain and ryegrass uh, and, and stop there. If you really want to go crazy, a small grain, ryegrass, and a clover and call it good. Um, there are mixtures out there with 10, 12 different things in there. What usually happens is you paid a lot of money for the rye to come up or the cows to pick over a lot of stuff that they're not familiar with to get to the rye. And at the end of the day, you should have just bought rye. Um, what we usually run into those as well is they all really need to be planted at their own depth. Um, now we could put the ryegrass and the clover maybe together, um, but I'd still even like to keep those separate if possible. Um, so if you have a, a drill with two boxes on there, you can put one in one box and one in the other. We can plant two ways, things like that. Um, one of the worst things that we can do is, is put a, a bunch of seeds together in one seed box and drill them because something's going to be at the wrong depth. Um, and then what we run into with, with broadcasting is usually rye, we can't get deep enough depending on our soil type um, to, to have that good seed to soil contact that it needs. Uh, so mixtures, they, they have their place. Um, if I'm just getting started, I'm going to lean more towards a monoculture. Um, or plant rye in one field and ryegrass somewhere else or something like that. So that way I get a feel too for what works for my farm um, and, and what the, the animals are going to perform well on rather than the shotgun approach of I'm going to put everything out there all at once and just put all my eggs in one basket. Uh, and then we find out that the cows will or will not eat something. Um, so I know there's a lot of mixtures out there that, that throw the radishes and turnips and, and those in there um, for some soil health benefits, usually how they're marketed. 
Um, but if our animals aren't used to eating those, you just paid a lot of money for them to pick around something. Um, and so that's, I like to have those in a field by themselves. Okay, good. Dr. Noble here from Fort Valley. Okay. In Georgia presentation, do you have any sense of economic comparison between grazing maybe and those who are used to feeding hay? So almost always grazing is going to come out on top. Um, unfortunately, we haven't had a livestock and forage economist in our state since I was in grad school here probably six years ago. Um, and so we don't have updated numbers on those. Um, it seems kind of counterintuitive because especially depending on the year, ryegrass can really give you sticker shock. Yeah. But when you look at hay production in its entirety, so all the fertilizer you put out, the chemicals that were put out, your time spent running through four different steps of hay production, and then your time feeding that hay, winter grazing pencils out pretty easily, even though you do have that upfront seed cost every year. Especially if a lot of you all are smaller producers and have to buy your hay anyway, um, because it's not cost effective to own hay equipment. That's where the winter grazing is gonna, gonna pencil out a lot more than what one of our general extension budgets would say that it would. What is Dutch clover? Okay. Um, so Dutch clover, it's it's a white clover that you've probably seen all your life and just not realized it. Um, so it's that really low growing clover that won't get out of your front yard. Um, it's usually right inside gateways uh, in our high traffic areas, um, places like that. Um, it's a really persistent little clover. Um, and you would, if you in, or live in kind of the northern half of the state, you may mistake it for just a white clover because that's what it kind of looks like. The problem with it is it never gets bigger than like three to four inches tall. And so when you're trying to, to keep your animals full and you've got a persistent clover that's only three or four inches tall, um, trying to outcompete your Bermuda grass or your fescue, that's where it causes a lot of problems. We want to thank Dr. Baxter for coming and putting together a really good presentation in a in a short amount of time for us. So we do appreciate it. And I'm sure that she can share her, inf her contact information if you have any further questions. And she gave us a lot of really good resources that we can access. I don't have them before me, but uh, you're going to talk anything about marketing or uh, uh, some information about uh, slaughterhouse, those kinds of things. Right. We are going to talk about, we're going to talk about marketing. There's been a, a lot of interest in that. The, the beef cattle processors as of a month ago or so, were still backed up into next year. So that is something that we're looking at. I would also let people know that there are methods of, of marketing through a processor that you don't have to have federal or state inspection. In the state of Georgia, our inspection process, well, in any state, you're supposed to be able to market within the state under state inspection only. So you don't a lot of people try to limit their their processing to a, a federally inspected plant like a USDA or a Talmadge Atkins in our Atkins in our in our state but you don't have to be federally inspected unless you're marketing across state lines so if you're going to try to market beef within the state then you you should be able to just use the state processing the plants that that harvest and package under state processing there's also custom processing which is where the owner can have the animal process for their own use so you can sell a live animal drop it off at the custom processor and the new owner then has the animal processed and pays for that themselves and so that's another way to market meat but we will have somebody to talk about marketing I think that one of the things that we'll talk about is also marketing, cooperative marketing. And so we will have some more of that information coming up in one of our presentations.
Thank you. Swanson. Hey, good afternoon. I want to thank you guys for the uh, for the outlet and for the education. Just wanted to drop a note about custom processing. If you custom process at a processor who has a TA or USDA, they have to report that to the Georgia Department of Ag. And if you don't have a cut sheet and a customer, and you're not selling that thing as retail, you can get in a lot of trouble. So make sure you're selling whole animals and not pieces. Just wanted to share that because I do that end up before living, but I've been visited. I just went over it with the, the state a couple of months ago. They came to see me about a custom, which was fine. As long as you don't pay for anything and you have a date showing that you sold a live animal. Yes, that's it. Yes. That's the important part. It has to. You have to be able to say your part was the live animal, and you don't. Ha it doesn't have to be. You can do, like you said, you can do custom at a TA or a Georgia inspected plant. But that kind of def. Well, that you know. The beauty of doing custom is you don't have to go to a TA or a Georgia inspected plant, which are sometimes more booked up and you take longer to get into those. So if you that, found that's why. Yeah. That's the workaround. All right. So if you just go to a, a plant that's not that's custom inspected, it's not it's not Georgia or TA, then you can get in faster usually. Thank you all. I appreciate it a lot. Thank you all for uh, allowing me to to host the meeting today. And uh, Dr. Baxter, we sincerely uh, appreciate from the bottom of our hearts uh, you coming on and taking time out of your busy schedule to bring us uh, some forage uh, information that is that is much that is greatly needed across the state, not just in this platform here as well. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. And all I would like to do to wrap up is just to say I also appreciate it, and I'm I'm glad to see everybody joining us. We had a good crowd tonight, and I look forward to seeing a good crowd again next week. Everybody have a great evening. Stay safe out there.